I can't believe the Godzilla is still going strong. Not just going, but going stronger than ever. Uh, the guy has an Oscar now. And, and there's no way to deny that the franchise has had its ups and downs. So I thought it was time to go through this series and rank some of them up. Now, there's 33 movies in the entire franchise. So there's plenty to pick from. And I couldn't really ask my patrons to watch 33 movies in one month. So I had to narrow it down to a manageable number. And it re really, it really hurt to not include some. But I figured I'd give a variety of the different eras and focus on entries that either had Godzilla as a solo threat or facing down one of his more famous co-stars like King Kong. And a couple that I would love to have had on here almost made the cut like, like GMK. But ultimately, I stuck with a dozen. And these are them. And I have no doubt that there's one that you would prefer to be on this list instead of one that I chose. But I don't know. What, what can I do? I chose these. And I sent this list off to my patrons. And they watched them and ranked them up. And these guys answered the call. They put their favorite at number one and so on down the list, putting their least favorite in dead last. I had a total of 41 entries this month, a, a pretty good number. And since we had 12 movies to rank, the best score a film could have would be 41 points. And the worst score would be 492 if every single person had the same film as Dead Last. And hey, speaking of that, oh no, there goes Tokyo. In Dead Last and oh man, this month was a straight up blowout. Like sure, it wasn't a, a clean sweep because it never is, but our Dead Last film here got a whopping 432 points, only 60 away from a perfect rock bottom. And it's Godzilla 1998, the Roland Emmerich one. It was put in Dead Last 27 times. So 66% of the rankings, a full two thirds of them had this in Dead Last. The best score that it managed to get was two third place spots. So it did have, I don't know, a, a little bit of love. And this was my dead last as well. And it was never not going to be. Um, I'll admit that I haven't seen this one in a while. And for a second, I thought, who knows? Maybe I'll watch this and, and say, oh, I was too harsh on it back then. This isn't all that bad, but it is. It's that bad. It's just such a mishmash of everything bad about Hollywood film from the 90s. Everything about this one just screams Roland Emmerich and his directorial style. It, it's so identifiable and so, so awful. The characters are flat and every line of dialogue feels like words on a script and not actual people talking. Plus, it can never decide if it's about a big monster or a misunderstood animal or what. It just wobbles back and forth between having this thing be something you're meant to be afraid of and then I guess feel bad for. And then there's a, a couple of things that I don't think are talked about enough. The first of them is the whole sewer thing because the movie tries so hard to constantly tell us just how big this creature is while at the same time saying that it's able to hide in the New York sewers without being seen. How big do they think that sewer systems are? Like the tunnels would have to be massively wide for this thing to fit in. Like as a film viewer, I find myself constantly confused about how screenwriters think that New York septics work. Between flushing them out every night at midnight with toxic waste and also being able to fit something that all of the marketing is based around the gigantic size of, I, I just don't know anymore. The other thing is that this movie gives us the absolute worst character in movie history with Audrey. So this woman dates a guy in college for four years and then breaks up with him after he proposes, but does so without talking to him and doesn't phone him or write a letter. She just ups and leaves and okay, fine, not terrible. But then years later, she sees him on TV decides she's in love with him again, stalks him, gives 
him a hard time for not being okay with her walking out on him, and then immediately steals a top secret videotape that causes him to lose his job. Then she gets mad when someone else steals the tape that she stole in the first place. And she's the female lead of this movie. It was a terrible thing to do. I never should have done that. Our number 11 film had a huge drop down because the 98 version was never not in dead last, not one time in this whole process. But number 11 did get 345 points, almost 100 points lower, and it's Godzilla 2000. It did get a single dead last vote, only 2% of the time, and also got one first place vote, also 2%. And I'm two for two here because I also had this in my 11th place spot. And in the end, even though I only ranked it one place higher than Godzilla 98, the gap between those two movies is, well, I guess as wide as a New York sewer. This movie is still an enjoyable watch and, and something I would rewatch with no qualms about it. Like, like, first up, I just want to talk about how Godzilla looks in this one because I think that it's one of my favorite designs. It, it just has this nice, I don't know, animalistic look with stylized fins that don't, don't look overdone. It looks substantially different than the previous designs, and yet it's still instantly recognizable as the big G. The irony of this one is that this was the film that Toho put out right after the American Godzilla. They did their big Godzilla versus Destroyer, in 95, which killed him off and ended the Heisei age. And when our version flopped, this was their response. And that redesign was what I think was their way of saying, hey, if you're going to redo our monster and make him your own, and then push it too far and have it not even look like Godzilla in the first place, well, we're going to show you how it's done. And they do they they modernized him from the heisei look and look at this guy anyone can tell who this is but then honestly in terms of the story it gets about as much wrong as the 98 version like knowing that they were planning to not make any more godzilla movies for a while and then when the american version flopped they reversed that and were like let's show you how it's done it's a bit of a bummer that they ended up making a lot of the same mistakes it's just like their answer was to just make the most standard run-of-the-mill Godzilla movie as possible. And it's essentially just the dullest parts of the Heisei era repeated. I'm not saying that they tried to like Americanize it, but it did feel like they were going for more of a general audience. And part of what doesn't work is their efforts to use some CGI, and it looks awful. However, when it does turn into a practical suit, the monster also looks pretty cool, even if it's extremely underutilized. That being said, I do think this is a bunch of fun and I still like it, but just not as much as most of the others here. Godzilla! Going down to our number 10 film, and this was easily the most split opinion that we had here because this one had so many lower votes but the ones that weren't low were pretty damn high and with 318 points it's Godzilla Final Wars. This was put in dead last three times for seven percent of the rankings and is the only film outside of 98 to get more than two dead lasts but also got two first place spots for five percent of the rankings. And I had this one ever so slightly higher than that, since I put it in ninth. And man, this movie is like someone heard me talk about Godzilla 2000 and just how plain and standard it was, and were like, fine, then here. Um, you say that you don't want a Godzilla movie that's formulaic? Well, how about something that is like 20 different formulas all at once? But then they just like drastically overcompensated. They really said, well, I know the Godzilla movies are starting to feel a bit of the old same, same, but let's just go in the complete opposite direction. This was actually Japan's offering for the 50th anniversary of Godzilla, and even if it never quite feels like a love letter to Godzilla, it absolutely feels like a love letter to the kaiju genre. Just an insanely over-the-top one. And in the end, 
I want to commend this one for really doing something different with a Godzilla film. But on the same note, I feel like I have to take points off for what that something different is. The whole almost Matrix vibe that they have going on just doesn't really fit. And when I say almost Matrix vibe, I should probably say exactly Matrix vibe. And there's just far too much of all that. But probably the biggest problem is just how long it takes the big guy to show up. In fact, there is just not enough monster in general. Instead, we get this knockoff that just isn't that interesting. I I'm here to see monsters fighting, not motorcycle chases and slow-mo mutant fights and people that they say are mutants but just look like regular people. But once Godzilla does show up, it's a lot of fun and it makes up for it. But even then, it wastes that potential. I really enjoyed seeing all the different kaiju from all the different movies. And this felt like an elaboration of uh, Destroy All Monsters, but it drops the ball by having the fights last a, a couple of seconds each. Maybe if they didn't spend so much damn time with the buildup and got to this stuff earlier, they could have spent more time with it. But I ranked it a little higher because I did have a good time with seeing monster after monster. And I respect that they like tried to stand out and be different, even if it didn't exactly work. This was one of the close matchups because everything so far has been big gaps in points. But as we go to our number nine film, it only dropped four points to 314. And it's the first matchup of the Titans King Kong versus Godzilla from 1962. This did get two dead last votes, 5% of them, and also got one first place at 2% of the time. And I had this one pretty close since this was my 10th place, and, and I just had this and Final Wars swapped. And look, I know that there was eight years between them, but this is only two movies removed from the 1954 original, and the change in tone is just jarring. Um, compared to the starkness of the original, it's so ridiculous on every level. And honestly, I feel like this swings too far into the absurd for me. And, and I know that when people think of Showa era Godzilla, they do think silly. But this is a tone that's more on par with the later entries that are deliberately trying to be kids movies than the more serious tone of what had come before and would still be there a bit after this. And overall, there's parts that are a lot of fun, but in the end, it's not really what I'm looking for in a Godzilla film. And one of the things that I'm not looking for is a whole crowd of actors in blackface, because yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty rough. And I'm just saying this right here, and a good deal of what factors into these films is how they handle the human element, because I'll enjoy any of the monster mashes, but am I fast forwarding any moment that they're not on screen? Well, in this one, I am, because all of the people stuff is just not engaging. Plus, the suits for Godzilla and Kong just aren't great. In terms of looks of the big G, this is not my least favorite suit of the whole series, but it is my least favorite on this list. And Kong is even worse, and, and it's compounded that they don't shy away from doing close-ups of that derpy face. The things that boost it up, though, are the more goofy things, because even though they're not the things that I really want to see in my kaiju flicks, <laughs> they're still kind of funny. Um, so having Kong get drunk and then the whole rock throwing thing and their fight will definitely entertain me. Plus, it has some of the more memeable moments of the franchise. Like, if you're watching the new Godzilla and Kong films and wondering just when someone is going to try to jam a tree down the other's mouth, this movie's got you covered. Let's head now to our number eight movie, and this dropped down, but not too far, since it landed with 301 points. And we're checking out our first MonsterVerse appearance on this list with Godzilla, 2014. 
It got two dead lasts, 5% again, and didn't get any first place votes, but did get put in second place three times. And I'm back on track because I also put this in eighth place. And this film is so frustrating because it sets up so much that could be great and then constantly just refuses to pay any of it off. Every single damn time that it gets to what you want to see, it cuts away. It loves showing you the build-up to some monster actions and revels in giving you the aftermath of the destruction, but just doesn't really want to give you the parts in between. You know, the giant monster stuff. The entire Hawaii sequence is outstanding. All the lead-ins with the water levels and the shots of the Muto and then that big fireball and Godzilla's scaly foot in that reveal. Oh, that reveal. And then, cut. Oops, we're not going to show you that stuff and instead give you a glimpse of the fight on a TV screen. Then, in Vegas, it's like, here's Las Vegas and all these people and there's a Muto here and man, wouldn't it be cool to see Vegas just get leveled? Well, we agree, but we're not going to show it to you. But wouldn't it be cool anyways? Plus, how weird is it that they're like, oh no, Brian Cranston is dead. Oh, whew, what a close call. He got injured, but he survived. Oh, well, full idea. Five minutes later, oops, he's actually dead. Uh, sorry. I, I actually might have been okay with that and seen it as like a cool marketing rug pull like Drew Barrymore on Scream. But they spent a lot of time making his character seem meaningful, but then he doesn't even do anything. On the plus side, it's got the right atmosphere, and the big guy does look pretty awesome. He looks enough like his own thing, so when you see him, you're like American Godzilla, but he's close enough to the original that you're not having 1998 flashbacks. I, I do think it's really weird, though, that at the end, they're all like, all hail Godzilla, he's a great guy and saved us all. And, and there's even like a news Chiron saying like savior and everything. And I'm like, yeah, um, all the people he caused to drown in Hawaii probably have something different to say. Let them fight. Number seven now, our final movie on the lower half of the roster. And this one took in 288 points. And it's round two on here for Lizard vs. Monkey, and it's Godzilla vs. Kong. It took dead last one time for 2% of the votes, and was ranked in first the same amount. And damn, I'm really on a roll here, since yep, I put this in seventh place. And I had to rank this one down a bit in my personal spots, because the movie's called Godzilla vs. Kong. His name comes first, but this is more of Kong's movie than it is Godzilla. And even saying that, there's not enough Kong. Um, every minute spent away from either of the big guys in this one is sheer torture. The Kong humans are more tolerable, and I don't mind them all that much, but the kids and Bernie stuff is just painful and unnecessary. And in this day and age, I'm sorry, but I don't want my hero to be a freaking conspiracy podcaster. Um, that being said, the action scenes are on point and tons of fun. Uh, part of the criticisms of the other MonsterVerse movies is that the action scenes aren't all they could be, but not here. All of the stuff where a giant lizard is duking it out with a big ass ape is worth watching, and I could literally just kick back and take a nap in between. The weirdest thing about this one is just how sci-fi it all is. This is just two movies away from the 2014 Godzilla which was set in this grounded real-world setting. And now we have hover cars and underground anti-gravity tunnels from Florida to Hong Kong. And it's just, it's just a bit much. It's hitting a point where it starts to feel less like a Godzilla film, uh, even the feel of the previous two films, and become more of something like, like Transformers. And, and I'm not really into those. But I put it a little higher than I put the 2014 film, even though the human stuff in that one was a little bit better, but that one's not giving me the monster fights I want, where this one is. In the upper half of this list, we're moving on to our number six film, and it only made it here 
by six points. And th this little cluster of films were all really close. And, and with 282 points, we have Godzilla, King of the Monsters. And, and what are the odds that the three MonsterVerse films would be clustered together like this? It was put in the dead last spot twice, 5% of the rankings, and never took first, but was ranked second one time. And yeah, you guessed it. I also had this one in sixth. I, I happen to really like this one, but it, it might be a little bit of personal attachment as well. Um, this was Stella's very first film in the theaters. They have these special screenings for parents at certain theaters where they turn the volume down a bit and they don't dim the lights the whole way. And it's just expected that there may be crying babies. And she, she was like three years old. And I thought, yeah, per perfect time to go see Godzilla. And it, and it was a huge success. Anytime that people were on the screen, she just sort of played around the seats. And anytime monsters were there, she was planted and reveling in the spectacle. So I, I have a sort of personal stake with it. And, and it's like they took the criticism of G14 to heart. And we're like, oh, you want monsters fighting? <laughs> we'll give you monsters fighting. Um, and I have to say, as a fan of Toho Kaiju, there's no way to it not at least have fun with this one. You have, you've got Godzilla, you've got Ghidorah, you've got Rodan, and of course, my personal favorite, Mothra. Even though they couldn't let her live through the whole movie, can, can you people just let her live one time? One time! But the problem is that the human stuff is just not that interesting. But thankfully, it's more interesting than 2014. But and at least they pare it back a little bit more. Uh, one thing that's funny here, and I'm not sure if it's intended as a callback to the old ones, but I thought it was hilarious uh, that they have Coach Taylor in, in this. And it's like he's, he's the only one that knows what's going on. and His instincts are always right. And like everyone else there is a part of this group that studies and tracks these things. But then this one dude strolls in and his knowledge beats all theirs. It just reminds me of the old ones where there was just this kid that's in, in front of a group of military advisors and it's just like, maybe Godzilla likes oranges. And they're like, oh, wow. Well, hey, we never thought of that. This kid's a genius. Here we go with our number five movie. And like I said, this was all uh, pretty close right here because this only drops three points to 279. And it's The Return of Godzilla or Godzilla 1985, whatever you know that as. Um, this had no dead last. The first film on the list to not get any. And it did get two first place spots, 2% of the time. And what do you think? Do you think I had it in fifth? Yep, I did. I, I had this one in fifth. I'm kind of in shock that this one was so close to the others uh, because I've always thought that this was a pretty loved entry. Uh, th and this one gets a lot right, but it also drops the ball a, a bit on the overall tone of things. After a bunch of films where he was this goofy, good guy character, it's great to see him return to his bestial form and once again become an unstoppable force of nature. It also understands the concept of making Godzilla a sort of social and political commentary, as this version is very firmly set in the Cold War. It's not as overt as, say, the 54 version was, but it's absolutely there. It also really makes the effort to have Godzilla be scary again. and doesn't pull punches with his destruction. And I know that now it seems dated, but at the time, it, it was a big upgrade in terms of how it looked from, as compared to the Showa stuff. But I think the thing that holds me back with this one is that it seems to want us to take this all seriously, which is a nice change of pace from the camp and goofiness of the films before this one. But it never quite achieves that level of darkness, that, that bleakness that the original had. It might be the filming techniques as well. But I just never felt that drama that people were in danger or dying. And that might be the filming technique. Like, this should be a pretty terrifying moment on the train. But I, I never feel like the people are actually in this thing. And this guy is smiling at Godzilla. Even later, when the destruction is bigger, there's still a form of comic relief with the drunk guy. But there are a few moments that do hit that proper level of mayhem, like Face Off and his fight with Super X is a series highlight. Although I have to say, and I don't blame this one as much as the later ones, I don't get why they figured out 
that Godzilla is attracted to these bird sounds and they can make a homing signal to guide him away. And then they just never used that again in any of the other Heisei films. Our number four film had a little bit of a bigger drop down now because it went all the way down to 231 points, a full 48 point drop. And it's the battle with Kaiju's most elegant lady, Mothra versus Godzilla. Again, no dead last votes, but it did get two 10th place votes, but it was also put in first place one time, 2%. And apparently you guys, we were really vibing this month because again, I had this in fourth outside of the original film this is probably my favorite of the showa era it's fitting that mothra's name is first in this one because it feels a lot more like a follow-up to her film than it does godzilla's but unlike the modern godzilla versus kong it doesn't feel like the big g gets slighted the whole tone of this one is fantastic and this vibe of magic is more in line with mothra and when you compare this to godzilla 54 it's a stark contrast Sure, it had already gone into the realm of silliness with the previous film, King Kong vs. Godzilla, but this is different because it doesn't necessarily feel as comedically light and more just totally light. But I guess that's to be expected from a movie with foot-tall twin fairies in it. But even though it's softer overall, it's not outright goofy. I almost wish that Toho had kept things in this, this sweet spot where Godzilla could still be seen as a menace, but it can still fit something that's doable for kids. There's some pretty great stuff in it, including the first battle between Godzilla and Mothra with her flying around, and a bit of the big guy completely covered in flames, and that great finale with the larvas covering Godzilla. Although it's kind of hilarious that they're like, this guy is completely unstoppable, and then they just like web him up and dump him in the ocean, and are like, well, that's that! But like, I don't know, he can breathe underwater, and that webbing isn't forever, so it's really just a short matter of time before he gets loose and attacks again. But the larva don't care. They're just like, eh, see you later! Luckily, the big guy turned good in his next appearance, so I guess the webbing made him heroic? Or, I don't know, he was like, this is embarrassing, and maybe I've learned my lesson. <laughs> Top three times, and it's the big guns left in all solo films. So let's see how this all goes. And our number three film went down to 218 points, an 18 point drop. And it's another recent one, Shin Godzilla. This did get one dead last, another 2%, but was also ranked first three times. So 7% of the lists. And I'm still on track because, yep, I had this in third. And man, this is such a great take on this. It's essentially a story that we've seen before. It's classic Godzilla shows up and starts destroying the city. But this is a side of things that we've never seen before. The bureaucracy. This one serves just as much as commentary on the wheels of government as the original did on the state of Japan at the time. It's certainly a cold movie and is less about the humanity of it all and more about the, the logistics. But it's a part of things that had to have existed behind the scenes of all the other films, and yet here it's shown to us. Sarah, one of the patrons, referred to this as West Wing, the Godzilla edition, and that's, that's pretty on the nose. And earlier, I made fun of how the Showa films and then King of the Monsters had these big groups of scientists and military men and experts on these big monsters, and then the whole plan just comes down to one person standing up and being like, hey, I know better than you guys. And this is what I think. And on that note, those movies become about individualism. One man's ideas versus this big monster. But this is different. This is about society and teamwork. So there's not one perspective and insight that's given preference. It's all of them working together that finishes the job. And even more crucial, it's not about force and strength. We, we see how that goes when they try to outgun him, and that, that, that works very, very badly. So the plan becomes about working together and using a fixed strategy, reflecting the times as opposed to the older viewpoint of rugged individualism. 
But, but enough of all that fancy talk. What about the monster? Well, this may be the most straight up monstrous that the big guy has ever looked. Other films, he's a force of nature. But here, he's just so blank. He, he almost has no personality at all and only exists to get from point A to point B, no matter who is in his way. And like some of the earlier revamps, this still maintains that classic look. You can clearly see that this is Godzilla, but it's also really distinct than any other version. And my man is straight up evil looking. Only two films remain, and ironically, it's the first Godzilla movie, the oldest, and the last one. Minus one, the most recent film. So let's see who comes out on top here. And with 113 points, pretty damn low. In second place, we have Godzilla 1954. This did get one dead last, a single DL ranking, so 2% of the time again, but was also put in first place 12 times. 29% of the lists. And here's where I diverge because I had this one in my first place spot. And this one was my number one because I think it's really defined exactly what works the best with a Godzilla movie. I mean, it's crazy to watch this and go into it with the whole idea that Godzilla films are silly. Just a guy in a suit stepping on buildings. Because this is such a somber, heavy film. And the black and white is so stark that it just adds to the overall bleakness. And this movie is bleak. If you've ever been like, oh, hey, Godzilla is kids movies, right? Uh, some family-friendly fun. And maybe if you've ever seen the American release with the Raymond Burr stuff, then you'd still kind of think that because some of the grim bits are either taken out or just don't get dubbing. Like, there's a moment where Godzilla is rampaging around and a mom and her kids are shown in a building and it's burning. And she's like, we'll be with daddy soon. And then we just see the building engulfed in flames. Like, Jesus, guys. Uh, that whole thing is in the U.S. release, but they don't have the dialogue. And it's just playing music on it. So it's softened. And then it's so easy to forget when watching a movie about a monster created by a nuclear bomb, that we are actually watching a film made by people who had one dropped on them and were actually dealing with the reality of it. This movie came out less than 10 years after the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Less than 10 years! That would be like if we had a catastrophic event on a much grander scale than 9-11 back in 2015 and made a monster movie about it right now. And one of the more interesting elements of this one for me is that there really isn't a main character as such. Like, it jumps around through a number of people and events, and it's more about the effects of these attacks on the country overall than it is on one specific set of characters, which I think is what Shin reflects in a way, although, it, it, although it, this one still comes down to one man's invention to save everything and the personal effects of it, making this a perfect blend of what would come with Shin and Minus One. And it's my number one pick because it, it took me a while to really get behind it and really understand everything that this movie was trying to say and deal with in regards to what Japan was going through at the time. But now I'm, I'm all about it. And now, obviously the cream of the crop here, our number one film. And it wasn't too close at all, since in first place, with only 77 points, we have Godzilla minus one. The worst score that got was eighth place, although it only got that once. And it took first place 22 times, 54% of the time. More than half of the lists. And I had this one in second, and Holy crap, I was so close to having this as my number one. But after rewatching the original Godzilla, I, I had to give it the top spot. But this one is so very, very close. But there's one thing that holds it back from being my number one. And that's the fact that it's, it's easily the best movie on this list. Easily the best movie. But it's not exactly the best 
Godzilla movie. This is probably the only flick on this list that I care more about the human stuff than the Godzilla stuff. When he shows up on screen, I'm like, hey, guy, uh, do, you mind, do you mind stepping out for a second? I want to get back to the people here. And I, I also do have a slight issue with the ending, which I know is nitpicking. But early on in the movie, they blow up half of the G-Man's head and they see it heal back. But then near the end, their plan to stop Godzilla basically blow up half his head. And I, and I just wish that the conflict resolution felt as satisfying as the emotional one. But hey, I mean, that sounds like negative stuff. But it's not, because this movie is damned great. Possibly my favorite movie of last year. I, I love it so much, and I am flabbergasted that I saw people talking about this movie and saying how it was nice to see a movie that was free of politics and not bogged down by American messaging. And oh my God, I have no idea what movie those people saw because this movie is dripping with social commentary, political commentary, and discussion of identity and ideology. In fact, I think that's what people connect with so much. In all of these other Godzilla movies, there's humans and most of their interactions are plot related and fairly surface level stuff. But this one goes into metaphors for survivor guilt, concept of family constructs, and a main character that defies the definition of standard masculinity. It, it, it's just this deep and powerful and moving film that also happens to have Godzilla in it. And to be clear, this is the best movie here. And it absolutely deserves the number one spot. Even though in the end, I personally think the OG movie is more of what I individually want. Even if it's not as good of an overall movie. But hey, this is the first G film to get an Oscar. Even though I think it was actually robbed. Robbed, I tell you, of a Best Foreign Film nomination as well. So there you have it, a dozen Godzilla films all ranked up. And let's take a look at this roster. And clearly, I'm not too mad about this because it's incredibly close to my own ranking. And, and I'm pretty sure that this is the most that my personal list has ever matched the consensus in the history of this show. But I don't know if you have different, uh, if you have different feelings about anything here. I, I think you should put them down below in the comments. And put you put your ranking down there, or, or if you think this all looks good, I don't know, comment that as well. Just say, looks good to me, or some such. And yeah, of course, you can be a part of these rankings and be one of the patrons that sends in these rankings every single month by just going to patreon.com slash movie timelines. We do a different list every single month, and you can participate for as low as one freaking dollar a month. One dollar, not bad. Um, also, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you enjoy the channel, hit subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified when new videos go up. And of course, check out that Patreon page. But yeah, keep on coming back and watching more videos because there'll be another one coming very, very soon. Thanks a lot, guys, and bye-bye.